Hey guys, thanks for tuning in. I've got a little bit of a different episode for you today. Uh, there's no guest. I thought episode 100, I'll do something a little bit different. So I'll just be talking a little bit about my story and hopefully share some of my perspective on some things along the way. Uh, if you're not interested in that and you just want the normally scheduled programming with guests and the like, I encourage you to turn this off and uh, tune in for the next one. But if you are interested, hopefully I can keep this a little bit interesting and uh, maybe you'll learn a thing or two about me that, that you didn't know. I'll get started sort of answering the question that I ask most guests to start with, which is to tell their story and start as early as they're willing to start and talk about you know how they got to where they are today and some of the decisions they made along the way. So in that spirit, I will start as early as I really can growing up. I was born with two you know, great parents. And a couple of years later, my younger brother was born. And I think being an older brother was uh, something I, I really enjoyed. It's it's like a uh, natural position of leadership, I'd say. And, and you get to sort of be a role model from a very young age in, a, in somewhat of a natural way. Uh, I always liked playing sports growing up, like being part of a team and competing and winning and I always cared a lot. Like I remember I'd lose a basketball game or something like that. And some people could just sort of shake it off and I'd be pretty disappointed and, uh, you know, feeling like I could have done something better and just cared a lot. Um, I was a pretty strong willed kid to say the least, uh, stubborn would be another word for that. Argued a lot with my parents and I, I don't think it was for nothing. I think I just sort of questioned a lot of things and, uh, you couldn't just tell me something and I would just take it very easily. I would always sort of ask why. And I think a lot of kids do that. Maybe I was doing it to sort of a, an extreme extent, but uh, I'm very fortunate. My, my parents were willing to put up with it and didn't give me the answer of, you know, it is this way because that's just how it is or you have to do this thing because I said so. But they actually sort of entertained or endured, uh, maybe is the better word, my... Um, you know, my questions and, and my arguing growing up. Uh, and beyond that, I, I was just very fortunate, I think, to have parents who believed in me and, you know, basically limitless potential. And you sort of hear that enough growing up and you start to believe it a little bit and you start to believe in yourself. And I think everyone could use some of that, whether it's from your parents, not everyone's so fortunate to have that. Maybe you find friends or significant other along the way but uh, having someone who believes in you, I think, is very important uh, because it makes it all the much easier to believe in yourself. And I think related to that, one of the best things you can do for a person is to let them know that you believe in them, whether it's a friend or a sibling or, you know, your kids, whatever it might be. Um, that's sort of stuck with me. And I think it's a, a pretty powerful thing. I was always pretty business minded. Um, just sort of finding whatever hustle I could. Um, I, you know, remember collecting sports cards and selling them on eBay and later buying Jordans and selling those on eBay and creating an Instagram with all my Jordans posted and things like that. Uh, I listened to a lot of hip hop in high school, which I think sort of lends itself towards that like hustler mentality where you have all these people who, just sort of came up from nothing and they happen to have built themselves up through music, but, um, you know, it's analogous to a lot of different things and entrepreneurship, I think broadly in high school, I started to work real jobs a little bit. And, uh, my first ever job was at a flower shop. Some kid in school told me that you got great tips if you brought the flowers out to the cars or whatever. So, I went out and got a job at the local flower store and ended up spending the whole summer in the basement cutting stems and there was no tips and it was pretty brutal. I was pretty tall even then and uh, I remember I had to like sort of crouch down in the basement and so that was sort of the beginning and the end of uh, my career working in the floral industry. But uh, later, I guess that might have been like my freshman or sophomore year and you know, the summer after that, I, I was fortunate to get a job with a local entrepreneur. Uh, he had come to speak at one of our career days at school or something like that. And 
Uh, he was into sports marketing, and I liked sports and figured marketing sounded interesting enough and went up after the presentation and asked him if I could work for him. And one thing led to another, and, and I did. Um, so that was an interesting experience just working for a guy. He's probably 50 or 60 at the time and spent a whole career in business and just getting to learn from anyone in business at that time is a pretty good experience, I think, and did that for a couple summers. Uh, when it came time for college, like I said, I was pretty focused on sports and, and not too keen on the classroom. So um, got into an okay school, but it was at that point that I realized that I had sort of taken my education growing up for granted and uh, just sort of the level of ambition that I was surrounded by. And I, I just didn't appreciate that. And when I got to the school and was surrounded by people who, who weren't quite as ambitious as I was accustomed to, um, I realized that I wanted to get back into that old sort of environment, the the one where people around me were sort of working to uh, to make something of themselves. And so I didn't know exactly what to do. I applied to a bunch of schools to transfer and didn't get into any that were particularly interesting. But I had this idea for a business and I thought it was one of my better ideas that I'd had at that time. And I'd always sort of tried to think of ideas for businesses and decided to take a leap and take a gap year to go and, and try to start a company. So I'm like, I don't know, 17 years old at the time or, or whatever it is. And just sort of took a step off the beaten path, which I think was one of the better decisions that I made. And the business itself didn't really end up working out after about a year of working on it. But the year itself, I considered to be a huge success. It was definitely one of, if not the most transformative times in my life. Sort of one of those things where you look back and there was a before and there was an after. And I think there's a few reasons that I'll speak to because I think for anyone listening who is young uh, or even isn't and just has the opportunity to take a gap year at some point, it's something I, I'd really recommend. Um, for me personally, it helped me to develop a positive perspective, I think, for the first time in my life where I was stepping off this beaten path, like I said, and all my friends are still in school and I'm doing something very different and, you know, spending a lot of the year by myself and... I realized that that could be pretty miserable, like a year's a long time, right? Or it could be a great experience. And I think something just sort of like flipped in my head where I didn't give myself the option to be miserable. Uh, I just chose to see everything as positive. And, uh, you know, I, I didn't mention, but it wasn't just sort of a lack of ambition. That was the reason I, I wanted to leave my first school. It was just a really rough year for a number of reasons. Um, I was like sick all year. There was mold in my room. Uh, I was last in registration for classes for some administrative error that wasn't my fault or anything like that. I just was like literally the last person in the school to choose classes. So I, I couldn't choose what I wanted to learn about and ended up in things that were really not at all interesting to me. Um, and all of that led me to this gap year, which in retrospect, I viewed as, you know, one of the better things that ever happened to me. And it made me realize that even things that are seemingly bad may be for the best and sort of led me to this belief that everything happens for a reason. And even if that's not necessarily true, and I'm not saying it necessarily is, I think it's a good way to look at the world because you sort of seek to make things that happen to you happen for you and find a way to, to make things work out for the best. Uh, and I think that attitude can often result in it happening. Um, and just sort of realizing that like taking this step into the unknown, you know, it's, it's hard to imagine what the good case scenario is and it's easy to imagine sort of the worst, but I became comfortable with this idea that the unknown has huge upside and the risk is often worth the reward and you can't really get reward in life, I think, without taking some level of risk. And it can be a calculated risk. Like in this case, I, I wasn't, I didn't have like a limitless downside, right? Like I, I had applied to some schools and one of them that accepted me, I was able to convince to defer my acceptance a year. So if everything failed, I could go there. Uh, but I actually ended up getting into a better school that had uh, previously rejected me. Uh, but I think they took me, I mean, my, my grades were the same and 
my SATs were the same and everything was the same except for the story that I had to write about in my essays about how I took this gap year and, and tried to do this different thing. And uh, I still squeezed in off the wait list, but at least it was enough and really enjoyed the rest of my time in school and and went back and, you know, I appreciated classes more than ever having been out of them for a year. I appreciated sort of the social element of school, I think, more than ever before. And, uh, you know, joined a fraternity, which, you know, has its share of flack or whatever. But I think there's something to be said for sort of struggling as a group. I'm talking about pledging, obviously. Uh, you can build really strong relationships, I think, through shared struggle. And, and some of my best friends are you know, from that experience. When it came time to look for a job, uh, I was sort of, you know, back on the path at this point and seeing the people around me who were ambitious were targeting basically one of two careers and that was consulting or investment banking. And both were fairly hard to get into, but not impossible coming from where I was. And you just sort of had to put the work in and study for the interviews and reach out to people and, you know, hustle your way in. Um, so I did that and I went for banking because I felt that I had more of a natural skill set sort of aligned with consulting, sort of that more strategic mind and, and things like that. Whereas I didn't know a clue about finance and figured that it was a pretty important skill set to build for a career in business, which is what I wanted to do. Um, so I was fortunate to get a job, not just in investment banking, but specifically technology M&A. So I got to see how companies worked and acquisitions worked and think about strategy a little bit more than you might in another position in banking and, and work with technology companies. And it wasn't necessarily the sexy technology companies that you, you hear about or that I talk about today, types of founders I have on the podcast. But nonetheless, it was technology companies and that was somewhat interesting to me. And um, I think more than anything else, banking, it, you know, from a young early age coming out of school, my first real job, it uh, got me accustomed to a really solid work ethic and a really solid work product. I think there's pretty high expectations. And again, I was surrounded by really ambitious people and that's a good environment for me. It's, it's one that I enjoy and it's competitive and, and everything like that. Um, but I knew that banking wasn't the end all be all for me pretty quickly. I, I looked at the people who were 20, 30 years in front of me and um, I respected them and, and they're good people and I learned a lot from them, but their life and their trajectory from where I was to where they were wasn't really the path that I wanted to follow. So um, I applied to a bunch of jobs, you know, like literally dozens of jobs over the course of a year or so, uh, basically in my second year of banking and got rejected from all of them. And maybe it's because I was applying to some pretty good ones, but uh, nonetheless, it's a lot of rejection to deal with. And uh, I just sort of persisted through all of that. And I think persistence, as you know, I mentioned, I didn't get into the school I ended up graduating from the first time I applied. Um, I didn't get this job in investment banking. Actually, I'd gone into my first interview and they never responded. And then I sort of found a roundabout way to get another interview and ended up getting a job. And so, you know, I'm pretty used to taking rejection at this point and uh, nonetheless knew I wanted to find my next step and started to think about the possibility of quitting without my next job lined up and sort of taking what might end up being something like another gap year. And that was an exciting idea to me. And, and obviously I would have preferred to have my next thing lined up and, and jump right into the next, but that wasn't really working out. So I had to consider the other option and, uh, there were a few things I thought about at the time that helped me make the decision, uh, a few different sort of decision-making frameworks, I think. And the first was uh, borrowed from Jeff Bezos, uh, his regret minimization concept, where you basically project yourself forward to age 80 or 90 or whatever it is and think about you know being on your deathbed, looking back at life and, and some of the decisions you made and thinking about what you might regret. In this case, I had sort of two options from my perspective, which was to keep going and, you know, keep doing my job and, you know, maybe looking for new jobs or to take this leap again, similar to how I'd done with my gap year and jump into the unknown and, and see what happened. And, 
you know, taking the Bezos framework, I couldn't really foresee a situation where I would regret taking that sort of leap of faith, um, especially given that I knew the first time I went and tried to start a business and the business didn't even work out. But nonetheless, the thing ended up being, you know, the gap year overall ended up being a great thing for me. Um, and on the other hand, I, I could foresee sort of looking back and regretting spending, you know, so much of my 20s in this job that I knew wasn't the long term thing for me and not taking that chance. Um, so, you know, that's oversimplifying the decision a little bit, but I ended up taking the chance and obviously, you know, maybe not obviously, but certainly I'm uh, glad that I did. So I didn't have any plan as to what was going to be next for me. Uh, I had a one way ticket to Italy with my girlfriend to just sort of relax for a little bit and decompress after a couple of years in banking. And so we flew out there and had a nice little vacation and she went home after a week and, and got back to work. And I figured out on the way to the airport with her basically where I wanted to go next and bought a one-way ticket to Paris, uh, booked a hostel for a week or 10 days or something like that. You know, when you uh, don't have any income anymore, you got to start to watch your expenses a little bit. And Paris is a pretty expensive place. So um, it was actually interesting. That was really the first time in my life that I had to think about, you know, how can I live on my own in a really cost effective way? And I think that was really beneficial after a couple of years in banking where, you know, as a young guy, you could basically spend, you know, you're making enough money, you, you don't really have to worry about what you're spending. Um, but I sort of went to the other side of the spectrum very quickly, where I was basically trying to see how little I could spend in a day. Uh, and still enjoy life and you know I'm, I'm in Paris and I don't know if I'll ever go back so wanted to certainly enjoy the experience but nonetheless thinking about cutting my cost of living a little bit and realizing the runway that you can build for yourself so I, I kept traveling sort of on a budget like that and uh, I had a friend at the time who was actually traveling the world he had thought it through a lot better than I had and planned this year-long thing and he was going to be in Japan. So I flew to Copenhagen for a few days to catch a flight to Japan and met him over there and spent a few weeks in Japan, which was a really cool experience. And uh, he was starting to train for, I forget if it was a marathon or the Ironman at the time, but um, training pretty hard. And so I picked up running with him, which was another nice perk of the trip because I'd never really been too into running or, or working out overall, but found that, you know, running long distances at a slow pace with a podcast going was actually a pretty enjoyable experience and, and a good way to stay in shape. So, you know, several months thereafter, I actually ended up running my first marathon, uh, didn't sign up for anything or anything like that, but I thought it would be pretty cool on my 26th birthday. It was in the, you know, thick of COVID and, and there was nothing to do and I had been training and I decided for my 26th birthday I wanted to run 26 miles and, and just went out and did it and that was one of the you know better things or, or prouder things that, I, that I've done um, but I got back from my travel and you know still didn't really know what was next but started to think a little bit and I remember I was watching a Jets game late in the season and they were losing to a winless Bengals team, which is pretty much as bad as it gets. And uh, I had been throwing around the idea of, of starting a blog. And for whatever reason, during this Jets game, which was just unwatchable, decided, you know, I'm going to turn this off and go write my first blog post about writing my first blog post, basically. And how, you know, if the Jets weren't getting killed so badly... I may have not gone and, and started this blog at the time that I did. And I think when it comes to starting anything, if you don't sort of start at that moment, there's always a chance that you'll never start. And so to some degree, I, I owe the Jets for everything and how horrible they are. Um, because, you know, had they not been losing so bad and had I not chose to start the blog at that point during that game, who's to say that I ever would have? So I kept on blogging for a while and basically was on this cadence that I had set for myself where I would publish something every weekday. And 
for those of you who write, you know, it's, it's pretty challenging to actually post something every weekday. And I didn't even have anything in particular that I was forcing myself to write about, but even just writing about whatever I wanted to write about, it's, it's hard to get to that point where you feel comfortable posting, but I was doing that and I was running and I moved back to uh, New York city, which is where I was in, in banking prior. Uh, I moved back in with my brother and I remember we were choosing between a four month lease and a 24 month lease. And the four month lease we figured would basically be 16 because we could just renew after the first four. And I remember I was sort of mixed between the two, but my brother was really advocating for the four month. So we went for the four month and it ended up being actually a pretty important decision because that was January or February, I think beginning of February, 2020. And uh, COVID started to hit New York in basically mid-March. So we actually ended up only spending a month and a half uh, of that four-month lease in the apartment. And both of us moved back to our family home when COVID hit and everyone was sort of leaving the city. And, you know, COVID obviously was a terrible thing for a lot of people. For me, the bright spot was that, you know, I, I was expecting to be in New York, paying New York rent and my runway, as I sort of mentioned, you know, that wasn't doing me any favors in terms of cost of living. So I was look, I was starting to look for jobs again. Um, but when I moved back home, my cost of living obviously went down quite a bit without rent in the picture and going out on weekends and doing whatever else you do in the city. And, uh, so I, ha I had a longer perspective where I figured I could continue to write for a while and not pressure myself to get a job right away. And uh, that ended up being a, a huge difference maker for me. Um, I traveled around in, in Airbnbs uh, for the next year and a half or so with my girlfriend um, going between Airbnbs and, and staying at home for a while, different places from you know the middle of the woods in Georgia to Charleston and we did spend a couple of months in Brooklyn. We were down in Tennessee for a while, went down to Savannah. So got to see some different places that I might ne never otherwise have had the opportunity to live, which was pretty cool. And uh, I guess halfway into the year or so, that was 2020 still, uh, I decided to start this podcast. And at this point I felt that I had a good amount of runway because I had spent the early part of this time off just sort of you know like I said writing and and reading about things I was interested in and taking a deeper look into crypto and uh ended up sort of getting the conviction to put a lot of my money into bitcoin and, and I didn't have a lot of money at the time necessarily but uh it was enough where bitcoin going up from late 2019 early 2020 throughout that year and into the next sort of almost gave me this sense of income. Um, even though I wasn't working, I was making money through appreciation faster than I was spending it. And that's how basically I went a year and a half or whatever it was of being profitably unemployed. So with the additional time that I knew that I had, I, uh, I started the podcast and basically viewed it as a, a really interesting opportunity to talk to really interesting people. And I'd always been a big fan of sort of reaching out to people and seeing if I could get a conversation with them or ask them a few questions. When I started the podcast, um, again, I had an idea for a few years that it seemed like an interesting thing to do, but um, I started sort of on a whim. I don't remember what exactly led me to do this, but I emailed uh, Aubrey de Grey and David Sinclair, two leaders in the longevity space, and basically invited them on my podcast and there was no podcast. Um, I just figured, you know, maybe one of them will say yes and, and then I'll have a podcast and I'll have to do it. And uh, sure enough, Aubrey was very generous to say yes. And next thing I knew I had a podcast and I, I didn't really think about anything too deeply at that point. Um, I actually recorded that first episode, you know, we went and scheduled fairly quickly and I, I wanted to sort of start for the sake of starting, like I'd said previously. And, uh, I recorded the first one with AirPods, like I didn't even have a microphone, uh, quickly ordered a microphone and, and had it, you know, it shipped in time for my second episode, which is a much better audio quality. And it's actually the microphone that I'm still using. 
as we speak, it was a $99 microphone that uh, has, you know, I've gotten my money's worth to say the least. Um, But I started that first episode with Aubrey and had no idea what I was doing, but did a ton of research and felt like if I prepared a lot, you know, how bad could things go? And I had what I thought was a really interesting conversation and uh, was really pleased with it and released it and, you know, didn't spend too much time on any other aspect of it really just wanted to make sure it got on Apple and Spotify. And I used anchor, uh, I think it's anchor.fm to get it to distribute across all those platforms. And I used my blue dot, which I had previously used for the blog as the cover art and, you know, basically took Joe Rogan's titling style where he just does the number of the episode and the name of the guest. Uh, and I thought that was the way to do it because I had, as a listener to podcasts, I had seen the different ways that people titled things and like all I really cared about was who was talking um as much more interested in, in you know the guest than any particular subject and to me the focus should be on the guest and so that's why I named them that way and I've continued to do that to date and just put all the focus on the guest and ideally it doesn't you know it doesn't really matter I mean of course I can do a better or worse job in, in, as the interviewer or, or the the host but um it really all just depends on the guest and whether they're interesting and what they have to say and how much energy they bring to the conversation, how much they're sort of motivated to have an interesting discussion. Uh, if they come in and they're just sort of low energy and don't really want to be there, it's going to be a bad episode no matter what I really do. And I've been very fortunate that most, if not all my guests to date have sort of brought that energy and been interesting people. A lot of people, probably the most common question I get is, how I get all these guests. Um, some people think I'm like casually connected or something, but, uh, the truth is it's just cold emails, um, or cold outreach through DM or whatever it is. Um, I've always, uh, I've actually always cold emailed people from a pretty young age. Just, it seemed to me that this email thing was like, you can reach out to anyone you want so long as you can find their email. And uh, I've learned how to find people's emails, actually recruiting for banking where you need to find like the email of an associate or whatever to reach out and try to network or whatever. And it turned out to be a pretty useful skill, which I've shared about as well. If you look up my blog post, the art of the cold email, um, you can find most people's email addresses in a, in a, you know, 30 seconds or a couple of minutes or whatever, just sort of guessing, you know, first name dot last name or first name at whatever their company email is or whatever it is. And uh, I've gotten a lot of no's and a lot of non-responders, but if you look at my guest list to date, you know, those are all of the S's and uh, it's pretty unbelievable how generous people are with their time. And the thing that I didn't anticipate was that I would have much more success with the cold emailing, you know, getting people to be guests on the podcast than I had previously just asking people questions or for a conversation or whatever it might have been, basically, I think, because podcast seems like this sort of like legit thing. And they also know that the conversation is going to be shared with and enjoyed by a larger number of people than just, you know, me and whoever the person is on the phone call. So um, that's been pretty cool. And, you know, anyone who's listening, who's thinking about starting a podcast, like just go do it. Um, whoever you want to talk to, reach out to them. And you might be surprised by who says yes. And how quickly things can develop. What I like about the podcast and, uh, you know, just sort of reflecting a little bit after a hundred episodes is, uh, I mean, there's a bunch of, a bunch of things, but one is that it gives me this sort of cadence where no matter what else I'm doing, I'm having like on average a conversation a week with someone I'm interested in talking to. And in order to sort of not embarrass myself or just have a stupid conversation. I end up doing a lot of prep work and basically just immersing myself in that person's perspective for the week or however long it is and uh, learning about the things that they're interested in and how they think about the world. And if they're like an expert in a given subject, I'll learn a lot about that subject. And it's just sort of a, uh, a programmed way for me to ensure that I keep expanding my perspective and learning different points of views and learning about different areas and, uh, subjects where, 
just by maintaining the cadence and, and releasing a podcast a week, it's like a forcing mechanism for learning, um, which I found to be very valuable. Another sort of takeaway is that a lot of people from their Twitter presence or, you know, reputation or whatever it might be, you might have certain sort of uh, ways that you think about them. Like one, you know, one person would be like Kanye, right? So he's like super controversial and a lot of people have like pretty polarized opinions of him. It's like a love hate type of thing. But I'm sure if you actually got in a room and talked to Kanye, and even if you listen to like him go on Joe Rogan podcast or whatever, like he's just a person, right? Like he's, he's not as unusual in either way as you might think he is. And he's not, you know, he's definitely different. And uh, for better or worse, it's, you know, gotten him to where he is now and everything like that. But I think one of the lessons for me from talking with a hundred people who prior to recording were pretty much strangers in, in almost every case, you learn that people while different in a lot of ways are a lot more similar as well. And, uh, in a long form conversation are a lot more reasonable, I think, than some might assume them to be and has just resulted in me giving people a lot more benefit of the doubt when they gain a certain bad reputation in, in certain circumstances um, to realizing that there's just like a person under there who's pretty similar to you and I and uh, is not trying to be bad or anything like that. And not to say I've had people on who have that reputation, but um, just realizing that people are generally in a one-on-one -on -one setting, long form, they're pretty nice and like pretty reasonable and they're just people, um, no matter how famous they are or whatever. Um, most people are like fairly down to earth and whatever. And of course there's ex exceptions or whatever, but I'm a hundred episodes in and I haven't like gotten on a conversation with someone where I'm like, oh, you know, that person, you know, maybe an exception, one exception that comes to mind in 99 episodes where I was like, ah, that person was kind of unpleasant, um, and unreasonable. But even that was a, a really useful conversation to me. I, I had some, there's some pretty interesting back and forth and I won't name the person, but um, it's just, you know, it's a good thing, I think, to talk to people who are outside of your immediate environment. They're not your friends or your family or whatever. Just talking to an interesting person. And, and in my case, a lot of people who have been sort of, you know, from all types of different backgrounds, all types of different interests all around the world um, and seeing that sort of common thread in humanity has been pretty interesting for me. Um, another consideration of, of podcasting for those who are thinking about doing it themselves is, and one that I think about a lot is sort of the trade-off between preparation and uh, spontaneity. So naturally, if you don't do a lot of preparation, you don't really have a choice. You have to be pretty spontaneous like I've been today and, and not having a lot prepared here. Um, and it can sometimes lead to really interesting conversations. I found some of my best recordings have been ones where I was sort of in a jam and didn't have that much time to prepare. But I generally default to doing a lot of preparation to over preparing probably. And I, I don't script questions really or anything like that, but I do have notes with areas that I'd like to hit on. And uh, I think there's a real trade off there. If anything, preparing just makes it a little bit easier for me to go in and I'm still sort of like, there feel there is a sense of pressure when I press record to start every episode. It's like, you know, is this going to be the one that is finally like a total train wreck? And it never really happens, but there are moments here and there where you don't really know like what to say next or where to drive the conversation. And sometimes when you're being more spontaneous, it's a little more fluid and a little easier to just sort of move on to the next. But when you're prepared, you also have this like sort of backlog of ideas and topics that might be interesting to discuss and so it's it's a real trade-off and, and I don't have an answer as to what's best or what the right balance is but for a variety of reasons I'm continuing to prepare um, in each case because like I said it's sort of a, a forcing mechanism on learning and immersing myself in that person's perspective and I think that among other things like I'm asking for their time and I place an extreme value on an extremely high value on, on time in general, my own as well as others. And I don't ask for it lightly. And so if they're sharing an hour with me and a lot of these people are like important people with a lot of things to do, um, and they're choosing to talk to me. And so I'm going to 
spend a good amount of time sort of doing my work and, and trying to make it as good of a piece of content as I can, as good of a conversation for people to tune into as I can. And, uh, not just be asking them sort of generic questions that I have, but rather trying to understand the most interesting areas that they might like to talk about and drive them to do so. Um, and that's been, I think it's been good so far. It's, it's very hard to know, but, um, you know, I don't have like big audience numbers or, or anything like that, but I think just from feedback that I've received in, uh, you know, DMS or people who do know me personally, who, listen to the podcast, I've had pretty good feedback. Um, and I think people tend to enjoy sort of my style, whatever that is. Um, so I'm going to keep going and, and trying to get better. On that note, um, while I, I am continuing to release an episode a week, as, as you've seen, and uh, expect to continue to do that for the foreseeable future, the podcast isn't and has not been my primary focus for about a year now. Um, and I think, you know, this isn't something I've talked about on the podcast before, but it's probably worth mentioning when I'm talking about, you know, how I'm obviously grateful the way things have worked out and I wouldn't have chosen another path and, and everything like that. Some of you listening might not really understand given the information I've shared, why that is that, I, that I'm so happy with this path. I mean, the podcast is great, but the thing that came out of it that again, I couldn't have possibly foreseen when I started the thing or before that when I started the blog or before that when I quit my job without having any idea what I was going to do next turned out to be my next full-time gig. And that's what I've been focused on for the last year. Uh, the short version of the story is that I had a guest on in the pretty early days of the podcast, someone I was really excited to speak with and had an awesome conversation with. And uh, just someone I, I admire and think is one of the smartest people in the world, one of the smartest people I've ever come across, at least from my perspective. And uh, basically had him on the podcast. And one thing led to the next. I started volunteering, doing a little work for him. And uh, eventually it, it turned into a full time job. And so that's what I've been focused on for the last year while running this podcast sort of as a, as a side hobby. Um, it's a pretty nice side hobby. I've enjoyed it quite a bit for all the reasons I've talked about, but, um, as you're more excited about what I'm working on, uh, spending the majority of my time on these days and excited to hopefully share more about that at some point in the future. The reason I think it's important to bring this up is because it really brought everything full circle for me. Um, just like how my gap year with the failed business ended up leading to a great outcome getting to go to this great school where I ended up spending my next three years and, and graduating from. Um, it's sometimes hard to know when you're in the middle of the leap of faith, if you're going to land or where you're going to land on the other side. And I knew that the podcast was going well and I'd enjoyed my writing and, um, you know, my running and focusing on my health a little bit and a number of different aspects, traveling and staying in Airbnbs and, and all of those different pieces of, this second quote unquote gap year, but I didn't know where I was going to land after all of it. And when I ended up landing where I have, I just remember this sort of tremendous sense of everything I had ever done felt right because I was where I was now and, and I didn't want to be anywhere else or doing anything else. And it's a great feeling when at certain points in life, you sort of hit these checkpoints that just give you that confirmation that the things you've done up until that point were were right, or at least you can sort of be glad that you did them because even the bad things, the bad times brought you to where you ended up. And if you sort of think about the butterfly effect or other concepts of the like, you know, any one thing going just a little bit differently might have landed you in a totally different place. And so I think you have to choose to be glad for every piece of it if you're glad for where you end up. I'm sure I could talk for a while about a number of different things and, uh, you know, maybe I'll do another one of these at some point. Maybe it'll wait until episode 200 or whatever. Maybe it'll be sooner. I don't know. But, um, it feels like a, a decent spot to, uh, start to wind down a little bit. I think, uh, you know, just speaking to 
you as the listener directly, um, you know, I, I want to say like, I really appreciate you taking the time listening to this episode. If you've gotten this far and, uh, other episodes that I've done in the past, however many you may have listened to, it's a pretty unbelievable feeling to be able to get on the microphone and have a conversation with someone that I know is going to be listened to by, you know, at least hundreds of people, if not thousands and and so on. And I'm sure those numbers will only continue to grow as I keep going. And even when just one person listens and gains some value from this conversation that I'm having and recording and sharing. And like I said, sort of some of the DMS that I get people who use words like I've been inspired and, and things like that. It's just a pretty incredible position to be in. And, uh, that's why I encourage other people to do it as well. If they're at all interested podcasting, you know, it's just this, uh, it's just a word or whatever. It's just a thing, but an, an activity, whatever you want to call it, but it's been hugely valuable. The people I've been able to meet and, uh, the people who have, like I said, taken value from it and made changes in their lives. It's impossible to sort of know the total impact that you're having but I can't help but feel like sort of just by being myself and uh, talking with people who I find interesting about interesting things and ideas that I think are important. Um, it feels like I'm doing something good. And I think at the end of the day, that's what most, if not all people sort of want to do is just spend their time doing something that they either enjoy or feel like is worthwhile or might have a positive impact on the world. And podcasting for me has been all of those things. And, you know, I could still have these conversations if no one was listening, but it wouldn't feel nearly as meaningful without um, people like you coming in and listening and taking from it whatever you do. Um, so I, I really appreciate you listening and, and hope you continue to do so. Uh, and I also want to thank, I don't know if any of them are listening, but all of the people, you know, the guests who have come on, over the last year and a half or two years, whatever it's been, uh, you know, people who ranging from just, you know, founders to really, you know, people at, at all stages of their careers and lives who have either made a huge impact already, or, or I think are going to make a huge impact and just trying to do something good with their lives and coming on and spending the hour or whatever it is with me, when they have no reason to do so, they're, you know, they're not compelled to do so. They're just seeing this random email come in with an invite and they choose to say yes. Uh, I think it's just amazing. And I'm just so grateful for all the people I've been able to talk to and, uh, you know, we'll continue to be grateful to, to all the people that I'll continue to be able to talk to. It's just an amazing position to be in. And, uh, really when I reflect, it's just, it's really just unbelievable. Um, so, you know, I'm going to keep going and keep doing my thing. I hope, uh, for all those people listening, you know, however many they may be, I, I hope you've taken something from all of this that I've been doing. And if not, at least it's good for me. Um, but I, I hope it's good for you too. And, uh, you know, if, if I can end with anything, uh, trying to wrap things up in like a, a way that feels uplifting or whatever. Um, I would encourage you to, to trust your gut and to, you know, not worry about what other people are doing or what other, other people might think. Coming back to that sort of thinking differently and living differently. Um, I think, you know, different for the sake of being different isn't necessarily the move, but a lot of times it's between doing something the way that everyone else does it or everyone else seems to do it and doing things the way that you feel you want to do things. And that's where the difference comes from. And I think just being sort of following that, that person and that voice that suggests, you know, maybe there's a different way for me to, to live and a different way for me to do things. And I can do something that really feels like it's, it's my path. I encourage you to take that path. Um, because you only get one go, right? And uh, I don't know, I, I've I've talked about this maybe once or twice before, but there's this Alan Watts video that comes to mind a lot where he talks about 
if you could live any life that you wanted to live in a dream, uh, you know, you go to sleep and you have like an 80 year life and you can just make it whatever you want to make it the first time through, you'd like, you know, you'd make yourself rich and famous and beautiful wife and family and, and everything like that. Um, and it would be amazing. And, and you'd wake up and you'd be like, wow, that was, that was an amazing life. Uh, and you'd do everything you wanted to do. But then, you know, whoever's controlling the thing says, okay, and now you can go and, and you can do it again. Is there any changes you want to make? Uh, inevitably, I think you'd, or maybe you'd just sort of run it back and say, that was amazing. I want to do it again. And you go and you do it and uh, you wake up and you say, wow, that was amazing again. Not, not quite as good as the first time, maybe because it wasn't as novel, but um, really great. And then you get the opportunity to do it again and you change a couple things because you don't want to just keep doing the same thing over and over again. And you might change this little thing or that little thing and you do it again. And you say, wow, amazing, right? And then so you keep going and after tens and hundreds and thousands of lives, you would change more and more um, over time just to get these different experiences. And then and I, and I think, I mean, that sounds reasonable to me. I think that's what I would do. Um, and after sort of like infinite runs, Alan Watts's argument, which I tend to agree with, is you would be like, all right, this time just surprise me. Um, and I think that's what life really is, right? Like you can't design how the whole thing is going to go. The whole thing is just going to be filled with surprises and maybe you can make an impact throughout, you know, on what your path is by making decisions along the way. But at the end of the day, you can't foresee the future and, and it's all going to be a surprise. And, uh, I think a lot of people, you know, the reason you choose the paths that have already been walked in a sense and the lives that have already been lived and to copy uh, aspects of the lives of those around you is because they're more familiar and it's, it's more comfortable to sort of know, like, you know, if I had stayed in banking, I can look at my boss who's 40 years old or whatever with a family and be like, all right, I'm going to, you know, my life, it's not going to be exactly like that guy. But if I stay on this track and get the promotions and whatnot, make the money, like I'm going to have a very comfortable style of living and, you know, be able to support my family and things like that. And, and it's all going to be good. And you can sort of project the future much more easily. But if you live a, a path that's a little bit more surprising and a little bit less where you can look 30 years ahead and, and know how things are going to be to some degree, that's the more surprising path. And I think that's the path that you would choose if you were able to live over and over and over and over again. And, uh, so I, I'd encourage people, you know, if that resonates at all, like take the path that that might be surprising where you can't see what what's down the line in 10 or 20 years or even five or a few. Um, take the path that's sort of a leap of faith and figure it out as you go. And uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm very young still, so I, I could look back on all this and think it's somewhat silly one day. But for now, it's it seems to have worked out very well. And, and I like where I'm at. And uh, I'm very excited about the future. I think that I try to look at life, you know, there's the past, the present, and the future. And I try to be grateful and appreciative of the past, not to have regret. And I think that's a choice at the end of the day. Uh, I try to be content in the present. I don't need to be like ecstatic at all times. I think it's unreasonable to expect that you would be. Um, you know, I have down days just like everyone else, but trying to be content and satisfied in the present because the present is what it is. You can't really change it, but the future, I think you can. And, uh, so I try to keep a positive outlook and, and be excited about the future and, and do things that give me energy and, and make me feel good. Um, and so, yeah, appreciative of the past content in the present and excited about the future, I think is a good way to be. And, uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you all for, uh, for tuning in a little bit of a different episode, but hopefully you enjoy it. And, uh, I'll be back with, uh, you know, normally scheduled program with guests and the like starting in episode 101. So appreciate you tuning in and, uh, thanks for listening and thanks, you know, for not just for this episode, but like I said, everything you've, you've you know, following me and, and my journey and, uh, listening to these conversations I've had with people, I think, uh, like I said, it's been, it's been an amazing ride for me and, I think it's just the very beginning and I hope the same is true for you.